the privilege of going to the FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes Banquet, and it was just a really fantastic night to see how God is working in the life of so many students and athletes and coaches, and just the testimonies were, were absolutely phenomenal. Um, but one of the other things that was just so touching and powerful was the amount of people that came up to me and asked me, how's Juliana doing? We're praying. Um, and, and so, so many of you have done the same exact thing, and so continue to pray for Juliana and, and Dom and, and Maria, um, uh, her parents, and, and we're, we're, we're praying for a miracle. Uh, we really are. And so, it just, it means so much to, to everyone, to our family, and especially to Dom and Maria. Um, on a, on a much, much lesser note, um, I have been struggling with an inner ear thing that has made me really dizzy, and I just not balanced. And so I asked for the first service to pray for me, and guess what? I didn't fall off the stage. So that was a win. So I'm going to ask you guys to do the same exact thing for me, because this morning I wasn't sure how this was going to go. So why don't we all go ahead and open up our Bibles now. We're in Matthew chapter 9. We're going to cover verses 14 through 17 together. Um, and why don't we go ahead and stand um, for the reading of God's word. It says, Then the disciples of John came to Jesus, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. Please be seated. So if you're joining us for the first time, for the last two months, we've been in Matthew chapters 8 and 9, where the Apostle Matthew records nine separate miraculous encounters that Jesus has with everyday people as he travels through uh, the small shore towns and fishing villages along the Sea of Galilee. And in these encounters, we find Jesus reversing the curse of sin in the lives of broken and hurting people people, whether it be healing the diseased or, or, or halting natural disasters or, or, or even exercising the demonic. The purpose behind Matthew recording each of these miraculous encounters is to reveal Jesus' identity and authority as the one true God of the universe who has come to proclaim the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand, that God himself has come in the flesh to conquer death and put an end to the pain of brokenness and evil caused by sin, whereby grace through faith in Jesus Christ we can receive eternal life and know the joy, peace, and comfort that comes with having a personal relationship with the one true living God. And so in our passage this morning, Matthew provides us with his second description of discipleship in chapter 9. We did the first last week when Matt, uh, Pastor Tom taught on the call of Matthew. And so here what we see is Jesus is asked a question about fasting. And in just four verses, the Lord is able to address the legalism of the Pharisees, give a short discourse on the kingdom of God, and provide us with two brief parables that point us towards what it means to follow after Jesus as his disciple. So with all that being said, let's provide ourselves with a three-part outline that's going to help us break down our passage together as we study it and, and help us to remember its different parts. And so this morning we've got three Fs, fasting, feasting, and following. So number one is fasting, that in the beginning of our passage, Jesus is asked a question about fasting, which eventually leads to a discussion on tradition, spiritual disciplines, and the danger of falling into legalism. Number two, feasting. Jesus responds to this question by explaining that there is a time and a place for fasting, but when we are in the presence of God, instituting and implementing his kingdom, it is a time to feast and celebrate. And then finally, number three, following 
Jesus provides us with two brief parables that points to what it looks like to follow after him as his disciples. And so with all that being said, let's move forward and look at our first point together where Jesus is asked the question about fasting. So let's go ahead and read Matthew 9, verse 14. It says, Then the disciples of John came to Jesus, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Well, as you know, every family has its different traditions. And growing up, one of ours was that at our big extended family Christmas Eve celebration, and you know the Italians, we do it right, it would be like 30 to 40 maniac Italians in one, one house. It was so much fun. It still is so much fun. Me and my cousins had to wait until midnight to open up our Christmas presents from our aunts and uncles. And I'm not exactly sure of the origin of this tradition, but I think it stems from our family. We would often get a very late start on Christmas Eve because we would wait for one of my uncles to get home before beginning to eat dinner because he was a caterer, and so he was out late delivering food. More than a feeling. (laughs) And And so he would be out late delivering food and he would actually be the one that really provided us with most of our Christmas dinner and so it was really cool that we would wait for him to get home to eat dinner together and I think to get the kids to stop asking when can we open up our Christmas presents our parents said not until midnight and that gave them a chance to breathe a little bit enjoy Christmas Eve dinner without their kids hounding them and so a new tradition was born And this went on for years, even though my uncle had retired and we no longer had to start dinner late. However, several of my aunts and cousins would still insist children of our family have to wait until midnight to open up their presents. Why? Because it's tradition. And let me tell you, when you have seven or eight children under the age of five, as we did in our family at one time, who are off of their routine because it's the holiday and they're hopped up on sweets from Christmas Eve dinner and they're absolutely exhausted from playing with one another all night. Waiting till midnight to open up gifts is cruel and unusual punishment on both the kids and especially the parents. And we tried to do this a couple times when my kids were very little and it caused my kids to melt down, Aaron and I to break down and it just made for a really horrible scene all the way around and just wasn't good for anybody. So because everyone was so exhausted at midnight, instead of seeing the the joy on our children's faces while they opened up their presents, there was really nothing but weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so instead of our family gift exchange being a blessing to our children, it was exasperating them. And so what this did, what what it caused some of the parents of young children in our family to take a step back and ask the question, Why are we opening up Christmas gifts at midnight when we don't have to? And it's making everybody miserable. And what we realized is that this family tradition had run its course, lost its meaning, and no longer served its purpose. So the point is this. When traditions lose their intent and purpose, we begin to serve the tradition instead of the tradition serving us. What this does is this opens the door to legalism where we end up forgetting and abandoning the original intent and purpose behind the tradition and in the process we become enslaved by excessive and cumbersome rules and regulations that lead to nothing but frustration and misery. And this is exactly what we witnessed in our passage this morning when Jesus is asked the question, why do we and the Pharisees fast but your disciples do not fast? And this account that we see here in in Matthew's gospel, it's actually found in all three synoptic gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. However, the people asking the question differs in each account. Here in Matthew, it's John the Baptist's disciples who ask the question. In Luke, it appears that the scribes ask it. And Mark, he doesn't specify. But regardless of who asked Jesus this question, what we know to be certain is that the people who had beef with Jesus and his disciples not fasting were the Pharisees with the Jewish religious leaders in first century Israel. 
And even though the only place God commanded fasting was on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the Pharisees had created their own laws and traditions that they had placed above God's law, thereby requiring people to fast twice per week for at least a portion of the day. And in the Bible, we see that fasting is a voluntary practice, tradition, and spiritual discipline held by the people of God. That it's often done in times of mourning, whether it be because of the death of a loved one or, or a national crisis or repenting of a sin one had committed, or the primary means, or the other primary means for fasting was as a spiritual discipline and seeking a deeper and sharper focus on God as an aid in contemplation and prayer and meditation upon the things of God, which is why John the Baptist's disciples often fasted. However, the Pharisees had twisted the practice of fasting by taking a tradition and spiritual discipline that was voluntary, and they had made it, made it mandatory. And so not only that, but the Pharisees also perverted the meaning and purpose behind fasting by teaching that it was a way to make yourself more righteous, where you could earn God's favor and approval towards your salvation. And this teaching went against the very heart of the message of the Scriptures and resulted in cultivating a culture of legalism. And legalism is when we depend on our obedience to the law and our good deeds to be our righteousness and our salvation instead of the work of God and our personal faith in God. Bible scholar and author R.C. Sproul, he writes... The first rule of the legalist is legislated where God's people are free. They take you may and turn it into you must. This is fatal to a healthy Christian life. The Pharisees who considered themselves the pinnacle of righteousness were the fathers or chief offenders of this kind of legalism and self-righteousness. Now, sadly, legalism has always been a problem within churches and Christianity throughout the centuries, particularly in the fundamentalist movement of the 20th century, which still lingers to this very day within those who try and compartmentalize God and their faith through the labels and distinction of what they term as sacred and secular. Now, let's, let's pause here for a second. Now, for almost all of us, if you've come to, to saving faith in this time, what you've probably had, or maybe you're even going through it right now, a time period where you were kind of overzealous in your faith, and you kind of fell into some of this fundamentalist stuff and this legalism stuff. Now, when I talk about sacred and secular, Right? A lot of times, we as Christians, so a lot of times we like to kid and we say we have our own language. It's called Christianese, where we're the only per people that use these certain terms and kind of words. And a lot of times you'll hear in Christianese, people uh, in the church separate things between what is sacred and, and secular, things that are overtly Christian and things that are not, Okay. Now, I have used these terms as well, and I understand what, what we mean when we use these terms, but I'm going to take a second to push back on them for a second here, okay? I want you to hear me out. That there is the thought process that persists in many Christian circles where anything that, anything that stems from the world or culture is to be condemned and deemed as having no value. And this can lead to an us versus them mentality, where instead of seeing God's image and the works of his hand that are crying out to be redeemed and restored, we see something that is irredeemable, that has no value and should be discarded. And it perverts and subverts the mission of God from being search and rescue to, to turning into seek and destroy, opening the door to abusive legalism and self-righteousness, and judgmentalism that is not of God. And where we've seen this in recent history is that in, 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 the, in the previous century, there was a movement, and the fundamentalist movement was that Christians used to be 
at, at, at the forefront of the arts and academics and, and academia and, and all these different things in the culture. But there was this thought process that said, hey, we're going to create our own Christian alternative to everything. We're going to have Christian schools and Christian movies and Christian arts and Christian this and Christian that. And so what Christians did largely was so many of them pulled out of the culture and created their own thing. And what happened when the Christians pulled out of the culture? It's what we got now. It's the culture we've seen go downhill. And so now there's a movement for Christians to re-engage the culture and to redeem the culture and to restore the culture because that's the calling that Jesus has put on our lives, right? That God, the Father, sent Jesus right, to seek and to save the lost, and now Jesus has sent us with his Holy Spirit living inside of us so that we should seek and save the lost. And so we need to understand that the scriptures point us away from the slavery of legalism and towards the freedom that is the grace of our God who reigns sovereign and supreme over all creation, which is what led the famous Dutch theologian and former prime minister to the Netherlands, Abraham Kuyper, to famously state, this is one of my favorite quotes, he says, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is Lord over all, does not exclaim, mine. That it all belongs to God. It all comes under his authority. And the call is to redeem and to restore God's creation, which has his image on it. And so we aren't called to abandon the culture. We are sent on mission to redeem it. And so the point is this. We must not allow ourselves to fall into the trap of becoming modern-day Pharisees. You know, it angers me and breaks my heart when I've been in the presence of Christians and I've heard Christians say things like, well, you can't be a Christian if you vote for a Democrat. You can't be a Christian if you vote for Trump. You can't be a Christian if you read Harry Potter or watch R-rated movies or drink alcohol. The implication being made is that the way to get to heaven is that we aren't to smoke, drink, or chew or run with boys or girls that do. It is this kind of legalism that creates within people an attitude of moral superiority and self-righteousness instead of the posture of grace, humility, long-suffering, patience, forgiveness, which was modeled by our Lord Jesus Christ. We even see this in Matthew 8 and 9. Who is it that Jesus goes after? Who did he, who did he go after in our previous passage that we looked at? It's Matthew. He was a dirty, rotten Jewish tax collector, the worst of the worst, the most despised, that Jesus came to seek and save the lost, to pursue sinners. And so it is legalism that deceives us into thinking that we can earn our way into heaven legally by doing good works and obeying the spiritual law and standard that we've created for ourselves. And this is what the Pharisees taught, even though it was in direct opposition to what God instructs us in his word. And in the Old Testament, we read in Habakkuk 2.4, and this verse is quoted by Paul in Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. So you know it's important. It's the righteous shall live by faith. And of course, in the New Testament, we read in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. This was our previous sermon series. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And what this means is that our approval before God, it's not based upon our own merit, but rather Christ's redemptive work on the cross and the power of his resurrection, which we can receive by grace through faith in Christ alone. If we could earn our salvation through our own merit or our own good works by being a quote-unquote good person, then why did Jesus have to die? Then we could save ourselves. That's the, the, the point the Apostle Paul, Paul makes in Galatians 2.21 where he says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And so we have to be very careful that we don't misconstrue the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is not that we obey God so that he will love and accept us. The message of the gospel is that God loved us first when we were unlovable. And it's because of the amazing grace and love of God that we are compelled to want to love and serve and obey our God and come under his authority. See, God is crystal clear in both the Old Testament and New Testament that salvation cannot be earned through performing spiritual, spiritual disciplines like fasting or fulfilling your sacraments, going to church 
or by doing good deeds. There's nothing wrong with these spiritual disciplines at all. And in fact, they're very helpful for our holiness. However, in terms of salvation, when we're talking about salvation, salvation is a gift from God to be received by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone so that none of us can boast in what we have done, but rather we boast in Christ. And we give God all the glory for what he has done and how he has rescued us from sin, death, and destruction. And this is is the good news of the gospel of grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the only way to eternal life. And at the same time, what we must also understand is that tradition, it's not a bad thing, but in fact can be a blessing in drawing us closer to God. And it's so very important that we be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to tradition in the church, as tradition is one of our primary means to worship God and celebrate his faithfulness throughout the centuries and, our, and his faithfulness in our lives. And so it's unhelpful when there are those that say, well, if it's old, it can't be good. Or if it's new, it can't be good. Right? Those, are, those are both extreme, unhelpful positions. And, and so what we need to be careful for is when tradition supersedes God's word and authority in our lives and leads us away from God and into legalism, that it becomes toxic and destructive to our souls. And so what we must recognize is that traditions... And spiritual disciplines don't have the power to offer us salvation, but salvation is only found in Jesus Christ alone. That healthy church traditions lead us towards freedom and holiness and new life in Christ, while toxic ones lead us into slavery, sin, and condemnation. And, and so let me make this clear, all right, about what I'm saying and what I'm not saying, okay? So I'm going to save you the time from writing me the, the angry email, okay? We are all free. We are all free to agree with or detest a certain kind of politics. We are all called to use wisdom and discernment in what kind of media and content we consume. In no way am I advocating that, yeah, watch any R-rated movie you want. I am not saying that, Okay? But what I am saying that these are wisdom and discernment issues, right? There are those who can and cannot drink in moderation. Of course, drunkenness is a sin, right? The scriptures make that clear. But the point is this. There, these are wisdom and discernment issues that we need to navigate as individuals and for our families. However, we must not turn these things into a law or litmus test for righteousness. We are not the moral authority. Jesus is our authority. We abide by his commands and live under his authority alone. And so with that all being said, let's move forward to our second point in our outline this morning, feasting. In verse 15, Jesus explains how there is a time and a place for fasting, but when we are in the presence of God instituting and implementing his kingdom is a time to feast and celebrate. And so let's look at verse 15 together. It says, And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. About six weeks ago, our family went to an all-inclusive resort in Aruba on what was one of the most wonderful and relaxing trips I've ever been on. I'd actually be down to go to, back to Aruba right now, now that I think about it. But, but, you know, we spent a couple of years saving up for this trip, and Aaron put a ton of work into researching it and planning it. And so just imagine if when we got to the resort, I turned to Aaron and I said, you know what? I've really fallen into bad eating habits lately, and, and I've neglected exercising, so I think I'm going to start my diet today. And I'm going to plan three hours, you know, to spend three hours in the gym every day while we are on vacation. She would have killed me. She would have killed me. Of course, she's all for me eating healthy and exercising, but not when we spent all this money to go to an all-inclusive resort in Aruba. Time and a place, man. Time and a place. 
And this is essentially the reply Jesus gives to us here in verse 15 when he says, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. You know, when you go to a wedding, you're not there to fast, to mourn. Well, maybe some weddings you are. But to mourn or to meditate. You're there to celebrate, to feast, and to party. And Jesus uses the imagery of a wedding here because this is the imagery that's used throughout the Old Testament where God describes himself as the groom and his people as the bride. We see this in Hosea chapter 2 where it says, In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. Baal was a false god. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And so in verse 15, what Jesus is doing is Jesus is making the incredible claim that the groom is with you. He is declaring that his, he's declaring his identity that he is the groom. He is God in the flesh. He is the one that has come to betroth his people to himself forever. The picture of Jesus as the bridegroom and the church as the bride of Christ is the imagery we see in the book of Revelation that portrays the complete fulfillment of the kingdom of God that we read in Revelation 19, verses 6 through 9. It says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, where the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. What Jesus is saying here is that it would make zero sense for his disciples to fast in his presence, that God's people had been waiting for their Savior and Messiah to come for thousands of years to come and to save them. They had prayed and mourned and, and they had fasted waiting for this day to come. And now Jesus is declaring that this day has finally arrived. The King of Kings is finally here. The kingdom of God is at hand. That it wasn't time to fast or mourn, but to rejoice and to throw a party. However, the Pharisees did not know or recognize what time it was, as they didn't understand God's plan of redemption or see the signs that the kingdom of God was at hand. As the Gospel of Matthew progresses, it becomes clearer and more apparent that the Pharisees had no love for God, which is why they did not recognize who it was that was in their presence. The Pharisees' desire wasn't to know God. Their desire wasn't to, to come under the authority of God, surrender to him, and, and, be, and serve him in building up his kingdom. But rather, they were looking to pursue their own selfish agenda so that they could serve as the authority in Israel in order to build up their own selfish kingdom and pursue their own selfish agenda. In fact, they despised and resented God so much that they would lead the charge in seeing that Jesus would be crucified. So Jesus goes on to say in the second half of verse 15, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. And after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection and his ascension, the time would come once again where it'd be appropriate to fast. In fact, early church historians speak to how shortly after Jesus' ascension, there were times of great voluntary fasting due to the immense persecutions Christian face, Christians faced from the Romans where they would be thrown, into, uh, they would be thrown to the lions. And, and even the evil emperor Nero would burn them alive and use them as torches to light his gardens. The early church would fast and pray for one another and seeking the Lord in such difficult times. And you know what? The same sentiment holds true today. Where I've spoken to so many believers who recently have been fasting and praying on behalf of the Ukrainian people. 
Then my wife Erin, that she has been periodically fasting on behalf of Pastor Nick's niece, Juliana. And many of you have shared with me how you have fasted in order to sharpen your focus on the Lord and seeking His face for the needs of the, the church and our community and for your spiritual formation and seeking the holiness of God in your life. And so here's the point. The point is, is that there is a time and a place to both feast and fast. As we read in Ecclesiastes 3.1, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And so with that being said, let's move ahead to our third and final point in our outline this morning following. That in verses 16 and 17, Jesus provides us with two brief parables that point to what it looks like to follow after him as his disciples. So let's go ahead and read verses 16 and 17, where it says, No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. The new wine is put into fresh wineskins, so both are preserved. In verses 16 and 17, Jesus provides us with two short and simple parables. In the first parable, Jesus makes the point that if you were to take a new unshrunk piece of cloth and to stitch it to an old garment, such as the case when trying to patch an old pair of pants, when you go to wash it, that new unshrunk piece of cloth, it's going to shrink, and it's going to end up making an even bigger tear in the garment than before you started. And so you just can't do that because it's not going to work. It's going to make things worse. If you're going to patch an old pair of pants, you need to use an old piece of cloth or at least shrink it first. And then Jesus makes the same point, essentially, in the second parable he gives where he uses the illustration of pouring old wine into new wineskins. You see, wineskins were made out of animal skins, usually goat skin or sheep skin, which would stretch to their very limit from the wine that would ferment after being poured into them. If you put new wine into old wineskins, when the new wine starts to ferment and begins to stretch the old wineskins that have already been stretched to their limit, they're going to burst, and you're going to lose both the wineskin and the wine. And so if you have new wine, you need to have a new wineskin so that it has room to expand in order to preserve both the wineskin and the wine. Again, here's the point. What Jesus is saying is that you can't just take the arrival of the Messiah and the inauguration of the kingdom of God and slap it right on top of your life without expecting your life to be transformed and turned upside down. You see, the Pharisees were looking for the Messiah to come and fulfill the purposes of their own selfish agenda so they could go on living the same way that they always had, as if nothing had ever changed. And you know, so many of us can be guilty of doing the same exact thing where we come to Jesus looking for him to fill a need in our life, whether it be physical or emotional, and we want to, to go on living our lives in the same way we always have, expecting nothing to change, expecting there to be no transformation. And, and we have to just call this out, what we see in the Scriptures. This is just not consistent. And what we see in the scriptures, that when you come to Jesus Christ, you are dead in your sins, and he takes your heart of stone, your sinful heart, and he exchanges it with his heart of flesh, that God's spirit comes and lives inside of you, that you're a new creation and in Christ. And so if you come and you say, yeah, I, I've trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation, and there is no transformation, and there's no evidence of that, then that's inconsistent with what we see in the Scriptures. That's simply not biblical teaching. In order to follow after Jesus as his disciple, it requires that we surrender to his authority over our lives. That we say, Jesus, come and be the Lord over my life. And it's a joy for us to do that. We're compelled to do that by grace, by his love. And what Jesus does is he transforms us from the inside out. And Jesus makes it clear that if we are to be his disciples, we must leave our old, sinful, selfish agendas, ways, and purposes behind us. 
if we are to follow after him into his kingdom. Jesus says in Mark 8, verses 34 through 35, the call of discipleship, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Let me paraphrase, paraphrase here. If you want to follow after Jesus, life can't be all about you. It can't be all about you. Following after Jesus as a disciple requires a radical commitment where our agenda, purpose, and personal mission goes from being me-centered to being Jesus-centered. In every single facet of our lives, we surrender to Jesus and his authority. Whether it be our time, be our treasure, our finances, our talent, how we serve the Lord, every single aspect, it belongs to God. He is Lord. I am not. I'm surrendering to his authority. See, the reality is, is that when we come to Jesus, we need to let go of those old things in our life. And we need to recognize that, that we got to let go of, of all these, these, these old things in our life because they just don't fit. They just don't mesh with the calling on our life and being a disciple of Jesus. We've got to let go of those old things in our life that are holding us back and weighing us down because Jesus has new and better things for us to pursue in him that will result in being for our good and for his glory. That in the same way the ceremonial laws and dietary laws and certain traditions from the Old Testament have been set aside because they've been filled, fulfilled in Christ, they have no longer have a purpose anymore. The old selfish pursuits that we once lusted after before we knew Christ have lost their purpose and meaning in our lives. The reason being is that by the grace of God, our eyes have been opened to the fact that these things outside of God aren't able to bring us the joy and fulfillment that our hearts long for, which can only be found in Jesus Christ. That in, in Christ, we start to lose our affection and our taste for those old sinful things. We have new affections in Christ. We have a new palate that Christ gives us that the Spirit gives us. The new wine that Jesus speaks of in this passage is the wine of the new covenant that re represents Jesus' shed blood in which he offered up for us by laying his life down on our behalf so that we may be forgiven of our sins. That in Jesus Christ we can have God's presence at the center of our lives and know the peace, joy, and assurance that comes with having the promise of eternal life in Christ Jesus. That we read of the promise of the new covenant that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ in Jeremiah chapter 31. Verses 33 and 34. Listen to what this says. It says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. When he says Israel, he means the people of God, not the actual physical nation of Israel. So I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And so we need to ask ourselves, is God's presence and the evidence of his transforming power present in my life? Or am I still stuck living in my old sinful ways, trying to pour new wine into old wineskins? making a mess out of my life? Are we still trying to clothe ourselves in the sinful garments that are old, torn, and tattered that just don't fit anymore now that we're a new creation in Christ? Listen to what it says in Isaiah 61.10. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom, decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Jesus Christ has come to pursue us. We were lost and dirty in our sin. 
make us clean with this precious shed blood that we are his precious bride and he has come to make us beautiful. Every single one of us is in need of the forgiveness of sins that can only be found through the new covenant in Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. He is our high priest who is our mediator and bridge to the Father. That when we trust in Jesus Christ to be Lord over our life by grace through faith in him alone, he replaces our garments that have been soiled and tattered by sin and he clothes us as his bride with his robe of righteousness and his garments of salvation. It is only Jesus Christ who is able to offer us the new wineskin that is the Holy Spirit which enables us to receive the new wine that is his precious blood that was shed for us at the cross which makes us clean and washes away our sins once and for all, enabling us to know God personally where we can walk with Jesus forever in his kingdom. We're going to celebrate this now together as the family of God at the communion table. I'm going to ask those that are helping pass out the communion elements that are assisting with the Lord's Supper to come forward. You guys can go ahead and distribute the communion elements right now. That this is what communion is all about. It's the new wine of the new covenant. That as followers of Christ, we have tasted the new wine of God's presence in Jesus Christ where we have been forgiven of our sins and and we have been satisfied by our Savior so that we will never thirst again. That it is at the communion table that as the bride of Christ, the church, that we remember, that we celebrate, that we eat and drink together with great anticipation looking forward to the return of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, where we will feast together in the kingdom of heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the assurance of salvation that we have in Christ. This is what we have to look forward to. That as Justin Tuck, he shared last night at the FCA banquet. He shared of all the accomplishments he, he's had in his football career, two Super Bowls and sacks and Pro Bowls and, and money and fame. And you know what he said? He said, I can't take any of that with me. He goes, but you you know what you can't take away from me? What I have in Christ Jesus. My eternal salvation in Christ, the hope of glory. And that was the center of his message. He said, he goes, you know what I walk away from this is? He said, Justin Tuck must decrease and Jesus must increase. And isn't that a beautiful prayer for each and every one of us? And so, as you receive the bread and the cup, let us remember the cross and the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ, only partaking if we have trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation and have made ourselves right before him by confessing and repenting of any sin in our life so that we may come to the communion table unencumbered. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a moment to be still to give thanks for God's amazing grace, his transcendent love and presence in our lives because of the cross. And after that time of reflection has passed, we're going to come together as the body of Christ, and we're going to eat and drink together in unison. So let's, let's take that moment of reflection right now. Thanks, brother.
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new covenant in my blood. And so do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. I'd like to call the worship team to come up to the platform. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing grace in loving us while we were unlovable. We thank you for the new wine that is your shed blood in which we have the forgiveness of sins and the new wineskin that is the Holy Spirit that we receive when we trust in you by grace through faith in you, Jesus, alone, which makes us a new creation, in which you clothe us in the garments of salvation, and that when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin, but he sees the righteousness of Christ, and that the chasm between us and God has been taken away, that Jesus serves as the bridge where we can be one with God, we can be one with Christ, and know the intimacy of a personal relationship with Christ, and have the promise of eternal life where we can look forward to that wedding banquet, the marriage supper of the Lamb, where we will be together with Christ forever, that there'll be no more sin, there'll be no more disease, there'll be no more suffering, no more pain, but we will finally be made whole be able to enjoy Christ, be able to enjoy God forever. So, Father, we worship you, and we give you all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord.